whining, your child comes up messing, it pisses me off. Our families, like you, we just, we just want Jamie home. At the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, we were wondering the same thing. Is Jamie out there? Is she even alive? Jamie Lynn Kloss was born and raised in the quiet rural community of Barron, Wisconsin. Her parents, James and Denise Kloss, worked at the local Jenny O Turkey store for 27 years. They were a typical American family. James loved talking about his high school sports career. Denise enjoyed working with her flowers and was a church member, while Jamie loved spending time with her friends and had taken an interest in ice skating and dancing. She felt safe in her room with her dog, and above all, she felt loved. Her parents took care of her and made sure she grew up happy and safe. They did so until they couldn't anymore. She wrote on one of her assignments in response to the question, what would you do if you were given a million dollars? She said, feed the hungry and give the rest to the poor. While the Kloss family was living their quiet and blissful lives, they didn't know that there was a malevolent presence closely observing them. A 21-year-old man had just started as a temp at the Saputo Cheese Factory in Almina, Wisconsin. On the way to work, he was driving through the desolate part of US Highway 8 when he came across a school bus idling on the side of a house's driveway. That was when he first saw Jamie getting into the school bus. She was an eighth grader, excited to go to school and see her friends on that brisk October 2018 morning. He noted her green eyes, strawberry blonde hair, and the home from where she came from. In his mind, that chance encounter called out to him, and he knew that this was the girl he was going to take. He immediately started making plans on how he would be able to accomplish it without getting caught. He took every small detail into consideration. He knew that if he planned it perfectly, he would get away with it. He stopped working at the cheese factory after two days, concentrated all of his efforts into the details of the plan, literally down to the hair strand. He drove to a Walmart in Rice Lake, Wisconsin, and purchased several items he'd use for the abduction. This includes a black-colored balaclava-type mask that would conceal his face. At home, he did some research and found out his father's 12-gauge Mossberg shotgun was one of the most heavily manufactured or owned, making it difficult to track down. He stole the license plate of a parked car and put it onto his old Ford Taurus. He disconnected his car's dome light to conceal his appearance and even cut the cord that could unlock the trunk from within. He wasn't leaving anything up to chance. His first two tries were unsuccessful. The first time, there were multiple cars in the driveway. The Kloss family was close to the community and their families, so they often had gatherings at home. On his second attempt two or three days later, the lights were on and there were a lot of people inside the house. Unfortunately for the family living in that ranch-style home, he tried for a third time. That night he wore steel-toed boots, a black ski mask, two pairs of gloves. He brought with him a knife, black gorilla tape, a flashlight, and his father's 12-gauge Mossberg shotgun. It was around 12.53 a.m. when Jamie woke up to his dog, Molly, barking. An unfamiliar red Ford Taurus coasted into the Kloss family driveway with its headlights off. She got up and looked out the window. When she spotted the unknown vehicle, she immediately went to her parents' room and woke them up. Annoyed at the interruption, James went to the front door to check. There was a man just outside on the red brick entrance stairs near the pumpkin decorations. James couldn't see the man's face behind the black mask and the glare of his flashlight. Upstairs, Denise's maternal instincts kicked in. She took Jamie with her, and they locked themselves inside the bathroom and hid behind the shower curtain. The mother and daughter were terrified and worried about Jameis. At the front door, the man outside was ordering James to get on the ground, a common phrase used by police officers, so he assumed he was dealing with one. The man outside opened the storm door and pounded on the wooden door. The Kloss home's main door had a small decorative window in the middle, encrusted with wrought iron. James used this window to look at the man outside and asked him to show his badge first. It was through this window that the man fired the shotgun, immediately killing James. The shot rang out, disturbing the quiet night of that northwestern Wisconsin city. The neighbors heard it but dismissed it as someone hunting, a common thing in their area. For Jamie, the gunshot shook her to her core. Right at that moment, she knew that her father was dead. Denise came to the same realization. She took out her cell phone and immediately dialed 911 to ask for help. Her frantic and inaudible call was recorded at 12.53 a.m. After shooting through the glass window, the man cocked his gun and blasted the doorknob. He got inside with his flashlight and checked every room in the house. He moved quickly 
and with purpose. He knew what he came for. He came upon one locked door and moved on to search the rest of the bedrooms. They were all empty, so he returned to the bolted door and started kicking it in. When that didn't work, he rammed his shoulders onto it, hoping his six-foot, 215-pound frame could split the entry in half. He was determined to get what he wanted, so he kept trying. In the end, he was successful. The Denise Kloss 911 call is absolutely chilling. You don't hear a whole lot of explanation. You hear some words, but you mainly hear the chaos that's going on. The armed man burst into the bathroom and pulled the shower curtains to find Denise protectively embracing Jamie inside the bathtub. It only took a few moments, but for the mother and daughter, it was hell. The man handed his black gorilla tape to Denise, ordering her to bind Jamie. Denise was terrified and hysterical, so the man put down his gun and did it himself. He covered Jamie's mouth and wrapped her arms and legs. The man only came for Jamie, so instead of binding Denise, he pointed the gun at her and killed her. As if the trauma of witnessing her mother's murder wasn't enough, the man dragged her into the doorway where she saw her father's body, her home, her caring parents, and her peaceful life were all taken from Jamie in the span of just four minutes. The man dragged the 100-pound Jamie through the lawn and into the trunk of his car. He got into the driver's seat. Adrenaline was still pumping in his veins as he took off his mask and laid the gun on the passenger's seat. It was 12.53 a.m. The 911 dispatcher noted when the call came into the Barron County Dispatch Center. It was nearly inaudible. No one spoke, and there was a lot of screaming. When the call ended, the dispatcher returned the call, but only Denise's voicemail. They immediately knew that something violent was happening in that home, so three Barron County Sheriff deputies were sent to investigate. With Jamie in his trunk, the man drove away from the Kloss home as fast as he could. After 20 seconds of driving, he slowed down. He could see blinking lights in the distance. When he heard the blaring sirens, he prepared himself for what would happen. He was prepared for a gunfight. He planned it in his head that if the police would stop him, he'd shoot at them. He yielded to the side of the road to let them pass, ready to grab the shotgun beside him. One car was heading out as we were coming, well, but they we'll yielded. Camera. camera, yep. A car's going that way. That maroon car that yielded. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, I ended at 54. Unfortunately, the officer's primary focus at that time was getting to the house as quickly as they could because they knew that an act of violence was taking place there. But they did take note of the maroon car that yielded for them at Highway 54. Inside the trunk, Jamie heard the sirens, but her heart sank when the sound faded away. After just a moment of hope, the driver of the maroon car confidently drove away. He knew they wouldn't be able to trace him with the stolen license. The deputies arrived at the Kloss home to a gruesome crime scene. They immediately saw the dead bodies of James and Denise Kloss inside their home, along with the broken doors that the man forced through. Body right at the front door, um, heavy trauma to the face, gunshot, looks like a shotgun shell to the face. Okay. Found another one in the, in the bathroom, almost directly straight back from the front door okay. in the bathtub, dead. The deputies noted that the door had been breached and they were missing somebody. They knew that the Kloss family had a daughter, Jamie, and she was nowhere to be found at the time. Soon, the drone of the Amber Alert was heard from cell phones across the state, and the widespread search for Jamie Kloss began. Photos and descriptions of Jamie were plastered around the state. The FBI offered a reward of $25,000 for any information that would lead to her whereabouts. After slipping through the police's radar on the highway, the gunman drove for an hour about 70 miles north of Barron to the tiny and heavily forested town of Gordon, Wisconsin. Population 650. He drove toward a brown and beige two-bedroom home set on 2.6 acres of secluded land. At gunpoint, he ordered Jamie to change into her sister's pajamas. The man forced her into the tiny space beneath his own bed, afraid Jamie could do nothing but listen to him and comply. He told her, no bathroom breaks, no movement, and no sound out of you. Those are my rules, and you better follow them, or something really bad would happen to you. He then shut her in with bags, bins, and barbells before going down to the basement. There, he burned all the evidence, including Jamie's clothes, the gorilla tape, and his gloves. He was going to burn his clothes, but he noticed that there wasn't a drop of blood on them, even his shoes. The town woke up to the news of what had happened. Barron, being a tightly knit community, meant everyone was reeling at the horror of the crime. The 
the whole community was closely monitoring everything as law enforcement launched a massive search. There were search teams put together. There were thousands of tips rolling in. 95% of those tips end up being nothing. Canvassing, knocking on doors, they did not exhaust one means to try to find their answer. The entire community of Barron joined in prayer for the safety and well-being of Jamie. Friends and family organized prayer vigils for her. Everyone's feeling very helpless right now and being able to pray together and just feel like maybe those prayers are helping in some way. Law enforcement was racing against time. They knew that statistically, for every hour that passes in an abduction case like this, the chance of finding the victim alive goes down. These are high stakes, and Jamie's life was on the line. More than 100 officers combed through neighborhoods. Tips came flooding in, and Jamie's Amber Alert webpage got 30,000 hits. Despite all that, there were still no leads as to her whereabouts. On the fourth day, the sheriff's office announced they needed 100 volunteers from the community to search the area. 300 people answered their call, eager to help out. And on the eighth day, the sheriff's office called for more citizens to join the investigation. The community of Barron was still there to help. We are asking for about 2,000 volunteers to walk specific areas in or around the crime scene to help with our investigation. People came in droves with lines of cars parked on the side of the road, and soon, the whole area of the crime scene was covered by a set of eyes on the lookout for anything that could help find Jamie and bring her home. I believe she's still alive. I believe she's still out there, and the hope is what we're riding on, and that's what we're gonna go with. Meanwhile, Jamie tested the limits of her captor a few times and watched his routine as days went by. He kept his shotgun just outside the bedroom door in case the police came. Twice, she tried to get away by crawling out from under the bed. When he caught her, he yelled at her and hit her with a curtain rod on her back was excruciating for Jamie, who had never experienced that much violence and aggression in her life. As further punishment, he'd shut her under the bed for 12 hours at a time with no access to food, water, or the bathroom. Still, she tested her limits. The man kept her in line by yelling at her and hitting the walls of the bedroom. It was different when there were visitors. On Saturdays, the man's father would visit the cabin. This gave Jamie hope that she'd be discovered, but her captor would turn up the radio in the bedroom to muffle any sound she'd make. About a week into the investigation, a sudden development diverts law enforcement's attention away from Jamie's search. Authorities were alerted of a break-in of the Kloss home. It was a massive red herring that cost law enforcement precious time and resources. The burglar was identified as Kyle Jenkianis. In all reality, they, it was her underwear or something like that. Any, any, any child comes up missing, it pisses me off. Turned out to be innocent of the murders and kidnapping. He was just a common thief who had served as a massive red herring of the investigation. On the twelfth day, James and Denise Kloss were laid to rest by grieving friends and family. Jamie never got to attend her parents' funeral while she was forced to live with the man who killed them. Why? Why? They're normal people. They go to work, they go home. A couple of weeks after Jamie's abduction, her captor had put away his father's shotgun, thinking that he had gotten away. He started softening up on Jamie. They watched TV together, ate together, played board games, and sometimes he even let her sleep above the bed instead of under it. As days passed, national media attention on the case of Jamie Kloss started to go down. With each passing day, the outcome was getting worse and hope was beginning to dwindle. Investigators who had set up in the command center to help find Jamie started leaving town. You know, we were averaging sometimes between 100 to 250 a day. Now we're down to that 25-ish range. So we need to scale back the operation itself. Days went by and turned into weeks, which then turned into months. Life went back to a somewhat typical fashion. Around town, there were multiple signs dedicated to Jamie. The town of Barron still believed and hoped that she'd come home alive. Christmas season came, and Jamie was still in captivity of the man who promised her harsher punishments if she tried to escape. There were times that he'd leave her for hours on end, trapped underneath the bed that only rose about two and a half feet off the ground. On Christmas Day, he left her for more than 12 hours to visit his grandparents. It might have been devastating and soul-draining for some. For Jamie, she was observing his routine and how long he'd leave her alone, which were getting longer and longer as the man grew lax on guarding her. On the 77th day of her missing, the town got together, sang hymns, and prayed for her safe return. Jamie's uncle addressed the crowd with gratitude and tears. Our families, like you, we just, we just want Jamie home. Concurrently, Jamie's captor firmly believed that he had gotten away with the crime, and in his mind, 
He was probably thinking of building a life with her. For that to happen, he wouldn't be able to support them unemployed. He would need to get a proper job. So he applied for a warehouse job on the morning of January 10th, 2019, the 87th day of Jamie's abduction. He told Jamie that he would be gone for a few hours before shutting her in under the bed. She knew she had time to escape based on the previous times he left her alone. She gathered her courage and pushed away all the bags, bins, and weights, keeping her trapped. She crawled out, went to the front door, and stepped out to a strange and snowy place. She put on the man's sneakers and stepped onto thick snow. She walked through the chill January landscape with just a thin layer of clothing, looking for someone. At around 4 p.m., she encountered Jean Nutter, who was walking her dog. Jean immediately recognized her. I was walking my dog, and we were almost home, and she was walking towards me, crying, saying, you gotta help me, you gotta help me. Jamie immediately told her the name of the person who abducted her, the same man who murdered her parents, Jake Patterson. Jean knew the man, and she realized that they were in danger just walking outside like that. At any moment, he could come back and follow them. She immediately took her to the nearest house. I just wanted us to be moving, yes. moving in a direction to safety, because literally that word was going through my head, safety, safety, safety. Luckily, Jean found neighbors at home in the form of Peter and Kristen Kosinskis. She just opened the door and said, this is Jamie, call 911 right now. We've been seeing her for so long, billboards, commercials, all this stuff, and it was like I was seeing a ghost in front of me. After Jamie had told them what had happened to her and the man behind it all, Peter loaded a gun and went to guard their front door. Kristen and Jean stayed on the phone with 911 and told them the whole story and pleaded with them that it was all real. Douglas County 911. Hi, I have um, a young lady at my house right now and she just says her name is Jamie Clock. It was a tense half hour for everyone inside the Kasinska's residence. Patterson could come back home and trace Jamie to that very house. 20 minutes into the call, everyone was terrified. They were asking the dispatcher nervously if they were close. The cops came 29 minutes into the call and everyone breathed a sigh of relief. Honestly, I feel privileged that I had this little piece of, you know, the puzzle of finding Jamie. And I just happened to be a social worker. I happened to be there at that time. It was, it was none, no doing of any man that did this. It, I mean, our neighbor was late doing things, walking her dog late. I happened to be home. Everything happened. I mean, it, it, nobody could have planned this. It happened for a reason. For 88 days, I have stood before you and said we would work tirelessly to bring Jamie Kloss home. Today, I can report we have done just that. The whole town of Barron rejoiced when they heard the good news. Signs were put up welcoming her home, and the community was filled with hope again, and even more so for Jamie's waiting family. I just got to see her. I just got to give her that hug. The most amazing, fabulous thing in the world. We've all been wearing Jamie bracelets. Uh, yep. You know, bring mm -hmm. Jamie home. Mm -hmm. And we all took them off and threw them in the kitchen. It was like, we, you know, we've got her. We don't have to wear our bracelets. <laughs> and you just feel lighter. You just feel so unbelievable. After Nutter identified the suspect, the police quickly located Jake Thomas Patterson, a 21-year-old ex-Marine. He was in his car at the time. When they stopped and arrested him, Patterson immediately told them he did it. On some level, He's confused, he's in shock, even though he knew this probably would be the end of how it all turned out. After four days, on Monday, January 14th, 2019, Patterson appeared in court via video phone for a preliminary hearing. At this time, he had given the authorities his full confession and account of what had happened. He even voluntarily gave additional dark details that would not help his case. He was going to shoot anyone inside that home, including children because he could not leave behind any eyewitnesses. I think Jake Patterson almost immediately confessed because he knew that if Jamie ever escaped, he was done for. Patterson claimed that he never inappropriately assaulted Jamie, despite his apparent obsession and infatuation with her. It was never about the sexuality of it. I think it was about the companionship and having somebody that he can have Hold accountable to him. They decided not to put Jamie through any kind of investigation. So we really won't ever really know what happened during those 88 days in full detail. On that day, he was charged with two counts of first degree intentional homicides and one count of kidnapping and armed burglary. His cash bail was set to $5 million. Back in the small town of Gordon, Wisconsin, the residents were shocked when they found out that one of their own residents was hiding such a massive dark secret. You can't believe it your own neighbor, 
you know, doing something like that. And here she's been in this house all this time, and we had no idea whatsoever. Jake Patterson was the youngest of three siblings. In 2008, his parents divorced, leaving Jake and his brother to live with their father in their Gordon cabin named Patterson's Retreat. We see them all the time working in the yard, working on cars. They were typical teenagers, typical kids. Kristen Kasinskas, who made the 911 call for Jamie, had been Patterson's middle school teacher at Northwood High School. This wasn't a kid that I ever would have thought would be involved in something like this. As time passed, his father and brother had moved on with their lives, leaving Jake alone at the cabin. He graduated from Northwood High School in nearby Meaning, Wisconsin in 2015. He was voted as the most quiet person in his class. He mostly sits quietly in a far corner, away from his classmates. After graduating, he enlisted in the U.S. Marine Corps, but was dismissed after merely five weeks of basic training. He returned home and had two very short-lived jobs, including his two-day stint at the Cheese Factory. The cops say I planned this thoroughly and that I said that. They're really good at twisting your words around, put them in different spots, straight up lie. Little mad about that, trying to cover up their mistakes, I guess. This was mostly on impulse. I don't think like a serial killer. When asked what was going through his mind when he started perpetrating the crime, Patterson said he was angry and didn't want to do it, but the reason I did this is complicated. I would like to humbly ask people to pray for a complete healing of Jamie's heart, mind, and soul. Her hearts are broken for their family. I'm very sorry for everything that has happened. On March 27, 2019, after two months in the Barron County Jail, Patterson's trial came. He was brought to court in handcuffs. Jamie's friends and family were all present and waiting for what would happen. All charges were read out loud for everyone to hear. Do you plead to that charge? Guilty. 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 Mr. Patterson, do you understand that by pleading guilty, you give up your right to a trial? Yes. The day of the verdict came on May 24, 2019. It was revealed that Patterson had plans to kidnap multiple girls and kill multiple families. This did not help his case. The judge dismissed the armed burglary count, but Patterson was still given the maximum of two life sentences in prison without the possibility of parole and an additional 40 years for kidnapping. It was a complete victory for Jamie's friends and family who were present during that two-hour court trial. It was a trial full of emotions from horror, disgust, sadness, and eventually, joy at the end. Jamie went on to live her life as close to normal as she could after everything that had happened to her. Two years after that trial, Jamie's aunt and guardian, Jennifer Smith, told everyone that Jamie was dancing again, something they thought her captor had taken from her. Even after years, her words still rang in their minds. Even though Jamie was not present in court that day, she confronted her captor with her words read by her attorney. Judge, this is the statement of Jamie Kloss. Okay. Last October, Jake Patterson took a lot of things that I love away from me. It makes me the most sad that he took away my mom and my dad. I loved my mom and dad very much. And they loved me very much. They did all they could to make me happy and protect me. He took them away from me forever. I felt safe in my home and I loved my room and all of my belongings. He took all of that too. I don't want to even see my home or my stuff because of the memory of that night. My parents and my home were the most important things in my life. He took them away from me in a way that will always leave me with a horrifying memory. I have to have an alarm on the house now just so I can sleep. I used to love to go out with my friends. I loved to go to school. I loved to do dance. He took all of those things away from me too. It's too hard for me to go out in public. I get scared and I get anxious. These are just ordinary things that anyone like me should be able to do, but I can't because he took them away from me. But there are some things that Jake Patterson can never take from me. He can't take my freedom. He thought that he could own me, but he was wrong. I was smarter. I watched his routine and I took back my freedom. 
I will always have my freedom and he will not. Jake Patterson can never take away my courage. He thought he, control, he could control me, but he couldn't. I feel like what he did is what a coward would do. I was brave and he was not. He can never take away my spirit. He thought that he could make me like him, but he was wrong. He can't ever change me or take away who I am. He can't stop me from being happy and moving forward with my life. I will go on to do great things in my life, and he will not. Jake Patterson will never have any power over me. I feel like I have some power over him because I get to tell the judge what I think should happen to him. He stole my parents from me. He stole almost everything I loved from me. For 88 days, he tried to steal me, and he didn't care who he hurt or who he killed to do that. He should stay locked up forever. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.